Good afternoon to distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to be with you today and to introduce our special guest, Stavros Lambernides, European Union Ambassador to the United States and the moderator, Gerard Baker, editor-at-large of the Wall Street Journal. Before I begin with formal introductions, I'd like to say a few preliminary words. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge how incredibly challenging COVID-19 has been for everyone. Seven months ago, I'm sure none of us could have predicted how vastly our lives would be impacted by the pandemic. Through the adjustments we have had to make and the painful moments we have had to endure, there have also been countless bright spots, acts of selflessness and support that have demonstrated the strength, kindness, and resilience that exists within people all over the world. During my time as ambassador to the United, of the United States to Spain and Andorra, I was afforded the opportunity to contribute to the longstanding 67-year diplomatic relationship between Europe and the United States. One of the great values of this connection has been our ability to form responses to global challenges through dialogue, collaboration, and partnership. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from one of the leaders tasked with continuing that tradition. It is a privilege and an honor for me to introduce today's very special guest, the European Union Ambassador to the United States, Stavros Lambernides. Ambassador Lambernides was born in Athens, Greece in 1962. He graduated with a degree in economics and political science from Amherst College, just up the street from where I am or down the highway. And he attended Yale Law School where he was managing editor of the Yale Journal of International Law. Ambassador Lambernides has held his current position since March 1st of 2019. <clears throat> Excuse me. Prior to that, from 2012 to 2019, he served as the European Union Special Representative for Human Rights. And in 2011, he was the Foreign Affairs Minister of Greece. Between 2004 and 2011, he was twice elected member of the European Parliament with the Greek Social Democratic Party. He served as Vice President of the European Parliament from 2009 to 2011, and as Vice President of the Civil Liberties, Justice, and Home Affairs Committee from 2004 to 2009. Between 2000 and 2004, he was Director General of the International Olympic Truth Center, an International Olympic Committee organization. Today's guest moderator is Jerry Baker. Mr. Baker is the editor at large of the Wall Street Journal. His weekly column for the editorial page, Free Expression, appears in the Wall Street Journal every Tuesday. Mr. Baker is also host of WSJ at Large with Jerry Baker, a weekly news and current affairs interview show on the Fox Business Network. Mr. Baker previously served as Editor-in-Chief of the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones from 2013 to 2019. Prior to that, Mr. Baker was Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the Wall Street Journal from 2009 to 2013. He's been a journalist for more than 30 years, writing and broadcasting for some of the world's most important news organizations, including the Financial Times, the Times of London, and the BBC. Ambassador and Mr. Baker, I thank you both for joining us. We are all looking forward to your conversation, and I will turn it over to our moderator. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, we, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I think we are going to have a really important conversation with the ambassador about the um, developments of uh, the relationship in the relationship between the European Union and the United States. Um, and I have a large number of questions and I know the ambassador has uh, all the answers to them. So I'm looking forward to hearing them. And then maybe um, we can get some, a lot of questions from the participants, uh, maybe a question or two that will stump the ambassador rather better than, rather better than I can. So uh, I look forward to, to hearing all of those. Um, again, ambassador, thank you very much indeed for having us and thank you um, uh, all of you for, for, for taking part in this uh, uh, at this fascinating time. Um, 
if I may, I'm going to start, uh, Ambassador. You, you can tell from my accent that I, I grew up in England. I've lived in the United States for more than 25 years, but I'm, but I'm um, a British citizen, and I want to get on to talk about some of the uh, consequences of Brexit for this relationship. But let me start by asking you a very, a very general question that I think is on people's minds. Um, the United States and the European Union, the, the partnership between the United States and, and Europe, let's say Western Europe, for the last so at least the last sort of 70 years since the, since the foundation of the European Union, since the um, end of the Second World War, has been seen in many ways as the kind of defining leadership of, of what we used to call the West and the ideas and values that these nations hold dear have been in many ways the, the defining and most successful values of, uh, the, of that period of the last 75 years and saw through victory in the Cold War and created the system, very much the system that we, that we have today. But in the last few years, I don't think it's um, an exaggeration to say that all of those um, those values, those systems, the the institutions uh, have been under siege in many ways. You've seen um, not only obviously the European Union going through some of its own traumas with the UK leaving the the EU. You've seen the rise of populist nationalism in many European countries. You've seen the rise, of course, of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has uh, made no secret that he's not doesn't exactly. Um, view that traditional relationship with the with the European Union with Western Europe as one of his greatest priorities and on top of all that of course we've seen the rise of China uh, and other countries around the world but particularly the role of China I'm wondering if you could start off by telling us ambassador what's left of this transatlantic relationship that actually is in any way any longer relevant to um, what how the world will develop and unfold in the course of the next five or ten years well, thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. I think everything is left uh, 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 intact in terms of the importance of the relationship. And what we have to do is to make sure that we uh, manage to bring it back to where it was, not uh, go back to the good old days. Uh, there's no question that there are new challenges out there and new responsibilities that we both have to assume. Uh, but you mentioned uh, China as an example. Uh, China is a major world power. Uh, you can wish it away. Uh, if you're an American, a European, or a Brit for that matter, but uh, it's not going to go away. So what you have to figure out is how to uh, persuade it to work with you uh, in areas in which it, uh, you, you would like to have that cooperation uh, and how you can persuade it or pressure it or push it to change in areas where it is uh, either a very unfair economic competitor, as it is, or indeed a systemic rival when it comes to human rights and democracy. I do not think that human rights democracy are uh, outdated, boring um, uh, principles and words. Uh, I think that our world is defined today by uh, crises that are being exported around the world by countries that fundamentally are authoritarian in nature uh, and uh, retreating from the international system that we built, as I am afraid uh, that in some instances I feel that the United States may be doing. Uh, is uh, the guaranteed way to leave black holes of power that then those powers that both we Europeans and Americans don't want to have the upper hand will try to fill. So uh, dealing with the unfair economic competition coming from China requires a cooperation between the EU and the US with the two biggest free open markets in the world. Uh, it goes without saying that if we unite our powers, um, China will have to stand up and listen much more effectively than either to pleas for cooperation or to threats uh, to change. Uh, but it's not just us. Uh, there are many countries around the world, Canada, Japan, so many others, with which we have to cooperate. Uh, working with interna international institutions, making sure they work even better, uh, but not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, such as the WTO, for example, uh, trying to reform them where they don't work uh, well, uh, but certainly supporting the process of interna international referee in international trade, because if we lose that, then it's going to be everyone for themselves. And we are not uh, the only big elephants in that room. Um, it's, it's something else we can do. Uh, speaking of values, think of this challenge, artificial intelligence. It's taken over our lives, already has in so many areas. Who's going to be setting the AI standards for the future? Who's going to guarantee it's going to be human-centric? It's going to be human rights respective. It's going to be transparent. I see today in China, how AI can be used and what standards can be set in places like Xinjiang, where voice recognition and body recognition and all those things are being used uh, in order to repress people and monitor them. 
Uh, I see the challenges even in democracies when you, you're dealing with very important things such as health tracing apps now with COVID and other things like that. We're going to be reaching a point where uh, outside the body surveillance, which was the standard up to now, you know, I click on a, on a site and you can see what I clicked on, is going to be moving in, inside the body surveillance, uh, apps being able to monitor uh, you know, uh, everything from our, uh, you know, uh, blood pressure to uh, everything else. And those things uh, could actually allow people, really smart people, uh, whether in governments or in companies, to be able to tell what we think and what we feel and why we think and why we feel it, perhaps faster than ever we know. It is a, the two biggest democracies in the world obligation to work together. So has the importance of this relationship actually diminished in today's world? Absolutely not. Is it more important now than never? Uh, you know, I can say yes, I don't like than ever, than this, than that. I mean, there were many parts of history that was important, uh, but it's hugely important today as well. And I am very optimistic um, that we can get it back in, on full track. It is back on track. We're working very closely together on many of these challenges, Americans and Europeans. Um, but in other instances, we need to do better. Let me ask you more provocatively then, if I may, a similar, the same question really. Um, if President Trump is re-elected in November, um, given what we've seen of the last four years and the um, approach that he's taken towards many European Union countries uh, and many of the leaders of those European countries and more generally towards the European Union himself, and he said some very harsh and very critical things about European, about the Union itself, um, about, it, about it being a protectionist organization. He said some harsh and critical things about European countries and their contribution in terms of defense to NATO. Um, he seems to be much more at home and comfortable with um, people who are not particularly seen as allies and friends of the European Union, like Vladimir Putin and uh, some other people. If, if President Trump's re-elected in November, then what would be left of the transatlantic relationship? Do you think, uh, do you think we can, that th this relationship can go on for another four years as it has done? Uh, yes, uh, but we will have to be able to address as mature partners or challenges uh, even better than we have before. And in some instances, uh, we have um, allowed them to spill over uh, and to give the impression of uh, fundamental existential disagreements when, in fact, when you look at the broader picture, the joint challenges, such as uh, China, um, uh, you realize that they are just basically blimps on a radar screen. Uh, but I, I cannot predict what uh, any future U.S. administration will do, but I can tell you what my emphasis uh, will be with, uh, with uh, whoever is elected. I will emphasize the importance of the European Union for the uh, strength of the U.S. economy and prosperity of the U.S. people as well. Uh, many people don't know what the U EU is, including in the EU sometimes. So I'm not going to sit here and, uh, uh, and give anyone any lessons, but I'll just wait, I'll say one thing. Uh, fundamentally, the, the cherry on the, on the cake of the European Union, the, 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 the crown achievement is the creation of the single market, so the so-called single market. Uh, what this means in practice is that we had the biggest deregulation experiment in the world happening on European shores. We trashed the laws and regulations of 28 countries, member states, and in their place we put one single set of regulations that eliminated all barriers to the movement of goods, services, uh, finance, people. And that created a market of 450 of the most prosperous and educated consumers in the world in which a U.S. company can come and invest in any corner of it and with zero um, inhibitions be able to trade uh, and invest with all these people. This is the reason why U.S. companies have voted with their feet. They have invested in Europe more than anywhere else in the world. They have made more profits in Europe more than anywhere else in the world. That single market that sounds like a bureaucratic thing coming out of somewhere is the biggest deregulation, unbureaucratic experiment in the world, and it's worked for U.S. prosperity as well. So I would work to ensure that we can preserve it. Does it have issues? Absolutely. We have disputes, including on trade. I would work much better to try to defuse those, uh, to work with our American partners, to deal with our mutual concerns uh, on, on trade issues, and, to, uh, and we already have had some successes. Very recently, we had a... Uh, a uh, small uh, uh, trade uh, agreement that opens the door for more discussions. Uh, I would focus a lot, no matter what the administration would be, on finally settling the Airbus and Boeing dispute. I think it is ridiculous 
that we are fighting over it. The, the EU, the, the US imposed tariffs after the Airbus decision came out, and we will be forced to impose tariffs on US when the Boeing decision came out. Frankly, we both lost our cases. And as we're fighting on this, instead of settling it, and instead of trying to determine what the appropriate subsidy principles for the airline building industry will be in the future, in places like China, white-bodied aircraft are being right now produced with 100% subsidization. So I will make sure that I try to make the point, I hope effectively, that we have no time to lose uh, for our companies and our businesses, especially coming out of COVID, where the airline industry is so hard hit. So um, when it comes to the economy, I'd say that. When it comes to security, you also mentioned before security. I would say that the European Union in the past few years has embarked in a remarkable effort to become much more efficient in the way that it invests, it researches, it produces, and it deploys people together. Uh, and, that, and that is armies together and, uh, and uh, weapons. Now, we are collectively the second biggest uh, investor in defense in the world after the US. But many people don't know that we have major inefficiencies. We have about 17 battle tanks in the EU that either we produce ourselves or, or we import. Uh, that's a ridiculous waste of resources. When we're talking about increasing expenditures for our own armies, which automatically become also expenditures for NATO, we don't have a special NATO army in Greece or in uh, Italy or anywhere else and a special one just for our countries, the same thing. When we're talking about investing more, it's got to be investing smarter. It also has to be investing in defense that looks at the way that new threats are coming out that frankly cannot really be addressed with a bigger weapon. You need the bigger and the better weapons, no question. But hybrid threats, what some other of our of revisionist powers around the world are using right now, uh, these require much smarter thinking and coordination, including in things like digital and artificial intelligence, all those things, uh, than simply saying that I've spent money on more guns. Let so, me yeah, I'm sorry. I, 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 I spoke a lot, but you got, you, I, I, I thought you, I think you, I hope you caught, uh, caught my drift. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, I, I, you're being very diplomatic, Ambassador, as, as befits your uh, role, obviously. But but you and I both know, I speak to European officials and uh, Europeans uh, generally a lot of the time. And candidly, they've been horrified by what they've seen for most of the last four years. They don't like what President, they don't like President Trump's rhetoric. Uh, they don't like some of the things that he's done. Uh, they don't like the challenge that they think he represents to the established order. Um, they don't like uh, his relations with other countries. Um, and they are praying with all, I mean, so if anybody in Europe still prays anymore, but the, 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 those that do are praying and earnestly yearning for a Joe Biden victory in November to reverse all that. It's true, isn't it? Uh, not to anything that my European leaders have told me. Uh, it's absolutely clear. Uh, that it is none of the business of the EU on who wins the election in the US, but it is the business of the EU to ensure that whoever wins uh, can rely uh, on the biggest and most important the, uh, partner the US can possibly hope for. It is the business of the EU to try to work with the US even when we disagree and try to change any administration's mind. We've had disagreements in the past couple of years, and maybe you're referring to that when you talk about consternation in the EU when it comes to addressing climate change, for example. Uh, this is not a hoax and it's not a joke. It's happening right now. Ignoring it right now, sticking your head in the sand. Uh, can't afford that. Do you, do you think President, has taken... President Trump did once say it was a hoax. Do you think he still thinks that? Or do you think he's... Uh, is that what you're referring to when you say it's not a hoax? I, I refer to many countries around the world. I certainly would have hoped that the U.S. would not have withdrawn from the Paris Agreement, for example. Because I really look forward to American leadership again in this. Uh, the EU has taken leadership. Uh, but we are uh, not the biggest polluter in the world, uh, by far not the biggest polluter in the world, EU and member states. So it's very important that the countries that pollute a lot get on board and do, and, 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 and do their, their fair share. You know why? Because this is not just saving the planet. That's a very important thing. But, you know, maybe there are people out there listening to us now that think that that is too kumbaya and too romantic and they don't care. Uh, it is also important because this is what the great jobs of the future and economic growth will amount to. Look at our example. From 1990, we have decreased carbon emissions by 25%, virtually more than anyone else in the world. And we have increased at the same time EU GDP by more than 60%. 25% emissions down, 60% GDP of the EU up. 
working on saving the earth is not a romantic thing. It is a hardcore economic policy thing if you look at the data. And we are determined to ensure that we do the right thing for, for, for our people, the health of our people, the, the safety of the food that they, uh, that they eat, of the water that they drink, uh, of the biodiversity that exists, that is being destroyed every day, and we'll make sure that we grow our economy dramatically after COVID. I hope that the U.S. can be uh, together with us on this. So I don't intend to preach anyone in the U.S. I intend to explain what we are doing, and I hope that this can be inspiring. If any particular administration disagrees, uh, that is the uh, prerogative of any administration. Let's take these issues, so many of these issues that you've raised, take, take some of them one by one. Let's start first of all with trade. Um, you know, a few years ago, there was a concerted effort to get a trade deal between the United States and the European Union, TTIP uh, negotiations that ended up um, going nowhere. Um, ultimately, I shouldn't say going nowhere, but ultimately being unsuccessful. Um, we are seeing, it seems, a kind of general retreat from international, certainly multilateral trade agreements. President Trump obviously has uh, taken a very tough line with China. Um, he's renegotiated NAFTA in a way that um, uh, seems to be more favorable to U.S. business. He's renegotiated some other agreements, such as, for example, with, with South Korea. There seems to be a, um, as I say, a broader uh, reluctance now for further multilateral trade agreements. Do you think who, again, forgetting whoever wins in November, whatever the outcome of that election, do you think we have to get used to that now, that actually those advances that we saw uh, at the, in the 1990s and the 2000s as we got more and more multilateral trading arrangements, do you think that's essentially now history? No, but I think you're right in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in uh, detecting an issue. Uh, so obviously, uh, I think all of us failed to see uh, the potential negatives of rapid globalization, including uh, very open trade, on how they affected parts of our populations. Uh, we only saw the positives, and there are many positives. But the negatives did leave many people behind. They did create uh, a much bigger inequality, especially in advanced economies, such as the EU, the UK, so the, or, or the US. Uh, and uh, not addressing those things on time uh, also created a sense of... Um, uh, the elites uh, ignoring the, 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 the working man or woman uh, and, uh, and a lot of populism flourishing uh, around the world. Uh, so uh, we are cognizant of that. Perhaps in Europe we're a little better placed uh, and we have been to address some of these concerns uh, because um, if you look at the uh, programs we have in place to support people to stay in employment as opposed to simply being fired at will, or if you look at the healthcare systems that we have uh, covering everyone, uh, whether or not they're employed in any particular moment, uh, we could to some extent mitigate some of the problems, but we didn't all of them. So uh, we have wisened up. Uh, when we talk about a green uh, European Green Deal now and a green transition, a big part of that is a dedicated fund we have created of billions and billions of euros that we call the Just Transition Fund which will be going directly to communities in the European Union that will be suffering from this transition. Coal mining communities, um, uh, workers or communities that work on a, a particular kind of engine in a car and then that will go uh, at some point to being a battery. Um, all, these, all these inequalities uh, have been ignored perhaps more than they should have been. And it is our obligation, in my view at least, uh, both for Americans and Europeans to take them very seriously into account. But g given, again, it, you described very well the political conditions in both the United States and Europe and indeed elsewhere, given those political conditions, is, is, a, is, is, a, is a resurrection of, trade, of, a, of, a, of a comprehensive trade deal, uh, the idea of a comprehensive trade deal between the United States and the European Union, is that, is that remotely feasible? I think, I think that is not uh, right now uh, in the center of the trade agenda. Uh, I think we are more focused now uh, between the EU and the US to ensure that we manage to address some of the uh, uh, irritants in the relationship. Uh, and we are also um, uh, increasingly focused on how we can address multilateral trade challenges, such as at the WTO uh, uh, level. Uh, make sure WTO functions even more effectively, uh, has new rules that address uh, uh, major issues such as um, industrial subsidies uh, coming from uh, China in a massive scale or, or, or from other countries. 
Uh, so um, I think uh, the ambition of having a major trade deal on everything uh, is not in the center of, uh, of our radar screen, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, but um, I mentioned Airbus and Boeing before. Um, this is not a uh, full-scale uh, uh, trade agreement. But think of how the airline industry and all those millions of people supplying it have been hit during COVID, perhaps more than any other industry. Think of the positive message to the markets that this could give. Uh, think of the positive uh, message to workers who would get their jobs back that this could give. A positive sense about economies rising out of the ashes of COVID could also change hearts and minds in terms of a bigger EU-US um, uh, trade relationship. But in the meantime, what the EU has done is not stay with our hands tied. Uh, a bigger part of our economy and our GDP depends on open, uh, free, fair markets. So right now we have uh, bilateral trade agreements with over 77 countries around the world. Many of them we negotiated over the past few years. Uh, they have been in the vast majority approved by uh, all uh, European parliaments and member state parliaments and the European Parliament in Brussels, uh, indicating that Europeans do understand uh, that if we manage uh, in the context of WTO rules, not as rogue players in the international scene, try to get over the fact that the system has to some extent slowed because of all these issues you raise and try to create openness of markets, reducing tariffs to close to zero, for products coming from all these countries to the European Union and vice versa, that this could be an indirect way to ensure that in the end of the day, um, uh, we can inspire the WTO system as well to follow many of these advanced trade agreements. In our agreements, we ensure that the environment is protected. We ensure that data privacy is protected uh, so that we don't exchange uh, data violating uh, data privacy rules, for example. Uh, we ensure that labor rights are protected. Um, all this is important stuff. These are issues that also the U.S. discussed with Canada and Mexico during NAFTA. So I do see areas of potential convergence there, honestly, not necessarily divergence. Let me just ask you briefly about Brexit, um, inevitable topic, especially right now. There's a lot going on. Um, there's been endless talk and um, much of it correct uh, about the costs to Britain of Brexit and the perils that uh, that, 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 are, that the UK is um, facing uh, outside the European Union. But let me ask you about what Brexit means for the European Union, particularly with its relationship with the United States. Britain has always been seen, I think it's fair to say, as the most as the, as the European Union country, the major European Union country that was closest to the United States historically, culturally, in terms of politics and intelligence and all of that, and economics too, in terms of investment and other things. And it's always been seen as the country, if you like, within the European Union, the, 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 the big country in the European Union that was the most kind of pro-market, pro-deregulation, pushing always for, a, you know, for, if you like, for a, a, what people might call a more Anglo-Saxon uh, approach to, for, to the European Union's economic structures. Britain's now gone. Um, you know, we don't quite know what ultimately what relationship the UK and the EU will have, but Britain's gone from the European Union. What does that, what is Britain's, and Britain's pursuing its own relationship with the United States, wants a trade relationship, will continue no doubt to have its intelligence relationship and military uh, connections and everything else. What does that mean? What does Britain's departure mean specifically? How does it, how does it affect the way the European Union, minus Great Britain, minus the United Kingdom, now uh, relates to the United States? Yes, indeed. Well, I mean, isn't it an irony, in fact, uh, that, uh, that Britain, who, uh, who, for all the reasons you mentioned, uh, was one of the champions of completing the internal market, decided to leave the internal market once it was completed and so beneficial for UK uh, businesses and exports, the vast majority of which go to the EU and only a small percentage of which goes to the, EU, to the US. In our case, um, the, uh, the Britain's uh, leaving... Um, uh, in theory, our hope is, would not affect any of those relationships that you mentioned, whether it is security uh, or defense, uh, or in fact, fighting for the climate, which the UK uh, has uh, been always a champion for, uh, or fighting for non-proliferation and all these issues that we still are very closely aligned. Uh, the negotiations that we're having now will determine where, where, where all this goes, of course. Um, when it comes to the United States, 
Um, the fact is that the EU, the EU will remain the biggest uh, single open market in the world for U.S. companies. Uh, and the strength of the European Union market will remain still the biggest uh, source of prosperity for uh, the U.S. here. Um, the, uh, uh, about 60% of all foreign investment today to the United States comes from EU companies excluding the U.K. Um, so you can tell from that and the millions of jobs created from in both sides of the Atlantic, this won't change. Um, I, um, I do hope that eventually uh, the EU and the US uh, will, of course, retain uh, their uh, privileged and remarkable relationship. And I also um, uh, wish that the UK and the US can have a very strong relationship as well. Um, the fundamental for us here, um, UK and EU, is to understand that if we manage to have an agreement uh, that uh, protects the uh, single market, the internal market that the UK works so hard to build, uh, that allows uh, for the UK to retain um, a level playing field, in other words, to keep uh, as many, uh, the vast majority of the rules that it already put in place uh, for that single market, that it, uh, that it required and demanded of other member states in the EU to put in place, in fact, as well. Uh, the more we can keep being convergent there, uh, the more our economies and our trade will remain uh, supremely high. Uh, and there's nothing better for the United States as well as, as ensuring a strength of the UK and the EU economy together. So um, if we manage that, that would be great. I, I initially, I thought that would have been an obvious feat and an easy one. I have to say that I'm quite surprised by the turn of events uh, uh, and what the UK government has decided to do uh, just recently, which is to fundamentally say that it wants to move away from the signature it put itself on the withdrawal agreement and some key elements of it. But OK, um, well, you mean, know, yeah, uh, hope, yeah. hope, hope, hope dies last. And, and my yeah. hope will definitely die last. We've got, a, we've got a Greek and a Brit here. We don't want to revisit the debates about uh, the European Union and Brexit. But I should just say, of course, the British government says that the European unions have, are not negotiating in good faith because the I understand that. And that's I, I understand that. Union, and I think that we cannot Greek, resolve that. You know, it's, right. it's kind of threatening to treat the UK differently from you know typically third countries and and in a way that would potentially leave the united kingdom i think look i mean we can have a big discussion of this and i think it's a fair it's a fair one to have at some point but i'll just say i'll just say no one no one disagrees that the uk put a particular signature in a particular international agreement called the withdrawal agreement and now it is trying to uh, amend that agreement on which it signed i think that's pretty clear now whether or not you know we are being fair in negotiations the uk and others that's another discussion to have but like i said we still have time in front of us to uh, to negotiate a very good deal, and I hope that we do. I hope that we do. Let me ask you about um, uh, technology. You talked a little bit about it earlier, and I want to get more into this. Um, the European Union has taken a very aggressive approach um, in the European Commission has taken an aggressive approach towards regulation of technology companies. Um, very strict uh, measures taken already against some of the major te technology companies like Google in particular. Um, and uh, there is a sense, uh, perhaps, that the, 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 to some extent, the, some of those similar same debates are being had here in the United States about the, the power of big tech companies. Are we going to see a fundamental divergence, though, between the way in which um, technology, data, uh, in particular, the you know the pri privacy issues that people have. We're going to see a fundamental divergence between the way the European Union operates on this and the tech companies, the way they are required to operate within the European Union, and the way the United States uh, approaches this this issue. I, I think it's a great question and a, and a really tough one. I'd say, in some areas you may see a convergence, and in some areas you may see initially a divergence. Uh, and where this will go will de will depend also on how we continue talking to the administration, to Congress to the companies themselves. So here's an area of convergence, privacy. Uh, the European Union came out with the General Data Protection Regulation a few years back. This has become effectively the world standard. A number of, of US companies, the major ones, have come out uh, to praise the GDPR, to indicate that they're actually applying it, uh, not just in the EU operations, but more broadly. Uh, and I remember, you know, I was, a, I was a vice president of the European Parliament back in 2009, 10, uh, big debates were happening on privacy then, and many U.S. and EU companies were visiting me saying, uh, this is going to kill innovation, don't do it, this is terrible. Uh, and, uh, and eventually, the companies themselves decided it was, in fact, a competitive advantage for them to be able to sell privacy and to bake it into their products and their services. So 
that is an area of convergence. And we're seeing now some states in the U.S., um, uh, such as California, having passed their own uh, equivalent uh, privacy bills. I think the challenge of the U.S. on privacy will be whether or not they will have a federal law in this country. Uh, because, of course, they, otherwise they may, the U.S. may face the same issue that we did in Europe before GDPR, having different states here, different member states in Europe, having their own regulations. And that would be a mess for companies having to comply with a different privacy law in California and Texas and, 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 and uh, in Ohio, what, what have you. Okay, now, an area in which uh, I think there can also be convergence is the area of setting standards for artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, and other things like that. Uh, not because our companies in Europe and in the U.S. always agree, but because there is, in fact, a true danger that if we fail to do so, others will do it for us. And that will be an entirely different type of technology. And if our citizens lose trust in that technology because they think it can be used for nefarious purposes, then they will not adopt it. And that will be an economic catastrophe in addition to a, uh, uh, a catastrophe for many other reasons. So I see convergence there. Where do I see potential divergence, at least we have it now, is on discussions on um, the digital services tax. Uh, and, but there actually is an area of increasing convergence on, on antitrust issues relating to data. So uh, if you accept that data and controlling data can create unfair market conditions, it's not any more just, uh, you know, your market percentage, but it's also your data collection, your algorithms, then you have to address those as well. Uh, the EU has, and I have to say increasingly looking at the congressional discussions and hearings and investigations now that uh, the Department of, uh, uh, of uh, Justice uh, is having and, uh, and the FTC, that maybe there's more convergence there. Uh, now, the digital services tax is a point of divergence right now. Uh, the U.S. believes that the biggest companies around the world are U.S. companies. Uh, and uh, and uh, that they should not be taxed by others. In fact, however, those companies make a huge amount of profits in Europe and elsewhere, and they pay virtually zero taxes there, and that is a very unfair competition against uh, small and medium and other companies and bigger companies in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, so we have to find a solution. Um, there has been a serious discussion at the OECD because it is our commitment to find a, an international solution to this, uh, the U.S. was engaging in this discussion, and then back in 2019, uh, late 19, it, uh, it withdrew from them, uh, and it froze them. So I would say uh, that could be an issue of contention, uh, and I hope that it's not. I hope we can all agree that uh, there has to be fair taxation of all companies, not just the, 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 the brick-and-mortar ones. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll just have to complete, uh, con uh, continue talking about this with the companies and with the, and with the government and with Congress. And what about national security? Um, the Trump administration has taken a very aggressive approach uh, on national security with companies like Huawei and uh, the, the th perceived threat that they represent to U.S. national security and indeed to national security interests around the world. Um, and by the way, I don't think it's just the Trump administration. I think if you talk to people who are close to Joe Biden, I don't expect one area where I don't expect there to be, I wouldn't expect there to be necessarily significant change should there be a Biden administration. Um, European countries have taken slightly different views. Some, some, some have been more, uh, some, some have very much been aligned with the US concerns about Huawei and about other Chinese, the, the, China, the, the, the threat from tri Chinese technology companies to national security. Others countries have been you know, perhaps by force majeure, as it were, by the economic circumstances they find themselves in, have been forced, whether it's with Huawei and 5G or, or, or other companies, have been sort of, have been, have been less inclined to go along with the United States. The, 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 there's talk of a tech cold war between the United States and China, in which the world is going to have to take sides, essentially. Are we going to side with the United States and its technology and its systems and its major companies? And perhaps there's opportunities there for the US and the European Union to come together. Or are we actually going to continue to see China extend its power and the threat that it perhaps it poses to, to global security through its technology companies? Where does the European Union stand on that? The first thing, which is a major priority announced today as well by the Commission President Interstate of the European Union address at, at the Parliament, is to create a more sovereign Europe digitally, uh, to ensure that we can uh, research and develop and invest more in our own digital companies, in our own protection of of, uh, of data in the, and the protection of our citizens' uh, privacy, but also in a very competitive uh, digital economy. 
Um, we don't want to be caught in between two elephants fighting it out, uh, which is not to say that we stand as an innocent uh, and uh, indifferent bystander. Uh, we do understand uh, the security concerns coming from uh, the illicit use of, uh, of technology, and we have taken very concrete steps to address them, whether it is um, uh, having our own investment screening uh, procedures now in Europe, uh, to ensure that uh, foreign uh, uh, countries, foreign companies uh, subsidized by foreign countries cannot come in and just buy up anything they want to in Europe that would uh, endanger our, our national security, but also by um, collectively, although it's a member state issue, deciding we're going to discuss the issue of 5G. We're going to identify what the risks are, including risks from untrustworthy suppliers because of the political systems in which they operate. And we put out a toolkit for our member states to mitigate those risks. So we are very much aware of those risks. Now, if I may say something broader here, because you use the word national security and it's very important. We also have a disagreement with the United States on the use of, of this word, because in fact, there are some areas, um, including 5G, where there may be some very legitimate national security concerns. But in the past few years, the United States has used a national security explanation in order to impose tariffs on products such as steel and aluminum, for example, from Europe, from the European Union, uh, claiming that they are a national security threat to the United States. We take exception to that. We have from the beginning, and we had to regrettably, but, uh, but inevitably, uh, respond with our own rebalancing measures against US products because of that. Uh, we are each other's biggest partner. We are not each other's biggest foe. Uh, and it's very important to be able to use, uh, you know, the discussion of national security and to focus it where it really is a real threat and to ensure that both our economies, but also our uh, alliances, our feelings, uh, or the feelings of our people, is always aligned on the EU and the US sitting at the same time, side of the table when it comes to these challenges. We've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience, and I want to come to some of those, and I will uh, in a minute. Let me just ask you one or two other quick questions, though. But um, first of all, the Middle East. Um, you saw yesterday, in fact, I think you were present, Ambassador, at the, uh, the signing of the Abraham Accords um, in, in Washington, the remarkable breakthrough that has been achieved in relations between Israel and many Arab countries. Um, most people you talk to in the region do think, and especially the Arab countries that you speak to, think that President Trump's very, very clear tilt, if you like, towards um, towards Arab countries, and in particular, his very tough approach towards Iran uh, has been critical in achieving this extraordinary rapprochement between Israel and these Arab countries. Israel and these Arab countries have seemed essentially to have decided that they have a much larger common adversary in Iran than they have uh, mutual adversaries in each other's countries. So President Trump took a tough line, uh, pulled the United States out of the JCPOA, has taken a tough line on sanctions um, and has achieved these remarkable diplomatic breakthroughs with perhaps really long-term implications for peace in the region. Did, did the president get this one, get this approach to the Middle East right and European countries get it wrong? Um, no, but I do think that the event yesterday gives hope, uh, serious hope uh, for, uh, for the beginning of a process that if managed uh, uh, effectively and, uh, and wisely, uh, could lead to more lasting peace. And in fact, uh, we, the European Union, has uh, from, the, from the beginning uh, recognized the importance of, uh, of this uh, rapprochement. In fact, it's something that we have been for years ourselves advocating with our Arab partners uh, and the Israelis uh, in every opportunity. So that was uh, indeed a very important step. At the same time, um, I think it's interesting to listen to the speeches of the um, um, uh, Bahraini and the Emirati foreign ministers yesterday in this in this event, uh, they both made a very strong point about the importance to them uh, of ensuring that the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue is not forgotten and it's resolved uh, according to international parameters uh, and uh, having a viable two-state solution work. Uh, this is something that is also at the same time a major priority of the of the European Union. And we have been supportive, uh, both politically, but also through our funding uh, of, uh, of the two sides to be able to make that agreement. So uh, our focus is relentless there. Now, when it comes to Iran, uh, we always uh, have recognized, uh, including all of us who signed uh, the JCPOA, uh, 
uh, the agreement to ensure, as it did ensure, the denuclearization of Iran when it came to weapons of mass destruction, uh, that Iran was not just that, that there were other dangers in the region, that Iran actually played a very, very subversive role. We in the European Union have, uh, have sanctions on Iran as we speak, in spite of the JCPOA, uh, that are still in place having to do with Iran's major human rights violations. So the real question is, what is the best way to ensure that Iran uh, becomes a, a, a constructive player in the region, and also that other Arab countries as well become constructive uh, in the region? I don't think uh, that there is any question that there are many conflicts, including in Yemen, uh, where you cannot uh, point a finger to, uh, to anyone who has uh, their hands clean of it. Um, so, you know, it's easy to have a narrative that is very black and white, but we all know how the Middle East has so many shades of gray, and gray perhaps is a charitable color to describe the shades. Uh, so. Um, we are very aware of the difficulties. We are very prepared to work with our American partners uh, and, with the, and with the countries in the region to, uh, to keep addressing them. Uh, and uh, I do hope, like you do, uh, that uh, the Abraham Accord signed yesterday uh, can be a very constructive step in that direction. Let's ask about a quick couple of a couple of questions that are coming up from from uh, from the audience um, about sort of about regional um, issues in within Europe. Let's me very briefly start with uh, Belarus, if I may, and President uh, Lukashenko. Do you think President Lukashenko um, is the legitimately elected president of Belarus? And do you think what do you think what do you want the United States? What can the United States and the European Union achieve that can perhaps um, can perhaps achieve some kind of a breakthrough there? Well, he's not, he's not even close to being a legitimately elected president. Uh, uh, we at the European Union have uh, publicly condemned these elections as uh, fraudulent and unfair. Uh, and uh, we're also discussing uh, intently the uh, level of uh, reaction we should be having, including with sanctions. Uh, and it's going to be very important in that reaction, I think, to coordinate with the US. I think that every time they were coordinated on sanctions with the United States, and any other approach, really, uh, beyond sanctions, because sanctions are never an end in themselves. You need them, you want them to be able to achieve an end. Uh, every time we've done that, we've been uh, effective and certainly politically effective. Uh, and every time we haven't, uh, we have. not So um, Lukashenko is, uh, is in a difficult, uh, in my view, uh, position, but, uh, but I don't uh, also ascribe to the theories that say that uh, what's happening there is a gift in, uh, in Russia's hands. I think that Russia is an equally difficult position. Uh, you're seeing a chess game being played out. Lukashenko has for decades tried to uh, keep a distance, not exactly an equidistance, but a distance from being controlled by Russia and Putin in particular. He's never wanted that. And I don't think that uh, uh, it's going to be an easy um, uh, equation to, to solve. But we have to be very firm, Americans and Europeans, in not uh, recognizing um, this election against the will of a huge number uh, of the uh, majority potentially of the of the Belarusian people and they're out there in the streets every way every day taking risks but ignoring as they didn't used to do in the past the dangers and the mass arrests um, we have to be there uh, and we have to support a democratic transition uh, democracy is not a dirty word uh, and in fact the real danger if this goes wrong by suppressing democracies that you could have another terrible mess of, of a state that is ungovernable. Another quick question about a, a regional question in, in Europe. Let me ask you, and this that the people are raising is um, Turkey, relations with Turkey. Um, obviously this is an issue um, you know, you're very experienced with um, from, from your own uh, national perspective. Um, but this issue, uh, first of all, I mean, the, the larger question of the way in the direction that Turkey's been heading <clears throat> under President Erdogan over the last uh, 10 years or so, and what that can mean for its ultimate relationship with the European Union. And, and if you could particularly, just someone's asked if you could especially address this question of uh, the current crisis on, on the Greek island of Lesbos, uh, the refugee crisis there, and Turkey's role in that, and indeed Turkey's broader claims on the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Okay, these are two, let's say, different issues, but I'd be happy to try to, 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 to address both. Um, Turkey has had, uh, quote-unquote, claims on the Eastern Mediterranean uh, for a long time. Uh, there are claims that are uh, patently against international law, and the European Union has said so. And when there are 
issues that in fact require negotiation between uh, Greece and Turkey or Cyprus and Turkey um, for the limitation of uh, continental shelf, or, uh, uh, I mean, uh, exclusive economic zones and all that stuff. In those instances, Turkey is trying to broad affairs its way through those negotiations. And we saw that recently with the ship that came out uh, violating um, uh, Greek territorial waters and trying to do um, you know, um, uh, energy explorations, while at the same time refusing to eventually, if peaceful negotiations don't lead to a solution, to take the case to the International Court of Justice, which is what civilized countries would want to do. So it's clear to me from that that Turkey is on a revisionist path. We have seen uh, Mr. Erdogan make a number of statements about that, about uh, the new role of Turkey in the world. It's also clear to me that Turkey's path really fundamentally is with Europe, its economy, its history, uh, are uh, uh, inextricably tied with, with the European Union and its member states. And it's a very important partner when it comes to a number of conflicts around the world. So um, it is a difficult task, but an important one that has been undertaken by the high representative uh, of the European Union to talk to Turkey and to find the best way uh, to convince it to uh, climb down the ladder of uh, saber, or saber rattling uh, and to work constructively with the EU in a number of crises in the region in which uh, it can play a constructive role if it decides to. Um, but, you know, uh, fundamentally, this is more than a European issue. It's also a NATO issue, and we're talking with, uh, with the U.S. on this as well and the NATO allies. Uh, on this. I mean, the S-400s, uh, we tend to uh, forget uh, that discussion uh, because every time that there seems to be a new provocation, a new uh, upping the ante, a new danger for, uh, uh, for conflict. Uh, uh, but, you know, there are many el elements of this that also uh, uh, have a NATO component. So um, I would say um, nothing more than what I just told you now. We're working very hard to ensure that Turkey can be a real, true partner. And certainly we will not, as European Union, um, um, remain um, uh, quiet. Uh, in fact, we may become very, very active uh, when it comes to violation of a European Union member state's rights. Uh, and this is what you see happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, as stated by, uh, by the European heads of state and government repeatedly already. Let me, a couple of questions about the pandemic and its uh, impl uh, direct implications. Let me try and sort of bundle them and ask you a broad question. We're all trying to get to terms with how this new world that we're living in will change our lives permanently and fundamentally. And see, with people taking a different approach towards travel, international travel, um, with global supply chains being revised pretty dramatically, uh, with more and more people focusing on essentially kind of staying close to home, businesses being close to home, is this, uh, do you think that will be one of the consequences of this pandemic, that there will be just be less uh, international engagement, there'll be less uh, trade, less global movement, less, less global uh, globalization, if you like? Are we going to see a, are we going to see a much, much more nationally focused, um, a nationalist focused sort of world agenda? I think initially we're going to see that. We're seeing it already, protectionist, protectionist uh, you know, instincts and tendencies. But I think very quickly we will understand and we will realize that open trade is the best way to actually get out of this crisis. And we have a recent example. It was the financial crisis. Uh, if you look at how the U.S. and the EU and others came out of that crisis, uh, you will see that it was a boost in international trade that allowed for our economies to go up. This is not to say that we're not thinking about the resilience of supply chain, especially when it comes to pharmaceuticals. We saw that those chains uh, collapsed um, when COVID broke out. So we as Europeans will be taking uh, care to diversify them and strengthen them and sometimes even uh, insource uh, uh, them. Uh, but we will not allow that to then spill over into a more general policy, uh, which in fact is very ineffective. We've seen it all the time uh, of trying to disengage ourselves with, with our partners in international trade. It doesn't work. In the end of the day, companies at the beginning, uh, uh, under protectionism may uh, feel some protection, but in the end of the day, they become entirely incapable because they have no incentive to innovate and to improve, uh, to address international competition. Other countries are way ahead of them and uh, becoming insulated uh, kills them. 
Uh, so protectionism doesn't protect. Uh, and, uh, and we have to be perfectly aware of that. Now, will we travel more? These are very interesting and difficult and difficult questions, uh, difficult to tell. Um, I guess uh, there may be, um, uh, when people feel that it's safe to do so, there may be a much greater need for people to go back to visiting others. Uh, and, I, and I believe that this is actually what's going to happen. That's my prediction. That's my sense. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing already when conditions are not supremely safe at this stage, uh, people wearing masks, following very uh, strict safety protocols and flying. Uh, and my understanding is that we haven't had yet a reported case or a case that we know of, of people catching COVID if they followed all those strict precautions uh, by doing so. Um, I do not believe that a curiosity for each other, for our cultures, uh, for the world, for different people, is going in any way to diminish. I do not believe that our thirst to explore new markets, new ideas, uh, new investments is going to in any way going to diminish. And, uh, and even if uh, we do more thinking about doing more things domestically, uh, I am I'm serious about this. I'm just simply convinced uh, that uh, things will go back to normal, but I don't, what do I mean by this? I certainly don't hope that they go back to normal the way they used to be. Our investments have to be much more sustainable and green. We cannot be polluting the environment. They have to be much more respectful of labor rights uh, and of equality. We cannot be creating inequalities in our societies or in other societies around the world. We have seen what this does. It creates social explosions and if we decide to create an environmental explosion and a social explosion as we're trying to come out of the crisis, then we will be the only ones to fault uh, for the results of that. Whereas if we, on the other hand, invest in green growth around the world, invest in fair, transparent investment so that Belt and Road is not the only alternative to countries who need um, quick, fast uh, cash and investments, but we can provide open, transparent, non-debt trapping, uh, respectful uh, of uh, rights investments. I am extremely hopeful that we will open up fast and the world will be better for it. Quick question, a couple of questions on Russia. And again, I'll, I'll sort of combine them. What's the, what is the European Union's perspective on, uh, on the Nord Stream uh, issue? And um, uh, countries, you know, essentially obviously russia plays such an important role in 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 energy production and distribution to the european union and, and people are wondering if it's becoming a, a bargaining chip to force collaboration on other issues and i want in particular if you can talk about what the eu's view of um germany's persistence with the with in, intent on persisting with the Nord Stream plan given what we've seen of russia's behavior in the last few months including the what what what, what the, everybody agrees to be the poisoning of the uh, political opponent uh, navalny well, I, I was at an event before this with the German ambassador as well, and I assure you that uh, she was uh, extremely open about uh, uh, all, the, uh, all the areas in which Germany itself is supremely concerned about Russia's system and what Russia is doing, including Navalny, but not just that. Uh, we are not uh, naive towards Russia. Uh, and um, we have, uh, with our sanctions in the case of Ukraine, which are hurting the EU and the EU economy much more than they are hurting the US economy, just because the volume of trade and investment that we have in Russia is much uh, magnitudes bigger than the volume of trade and investment the US has. And yet we are there at the front lines. Uh, we have shown that we can be very tough. Uh, when it comes to uh, Nord Stream, uh, what we did, all member states, uh, is that we uh, amended the gas directive of the EU to ensure that no pipeline, whether Nord Stream or anyone else, can bring gas to the EU without fully respecting EU laws, which means you have to unbundle it, which means you cannot hoard it, which means you cannot really use it to blackmail any EU member state. What we are arguing, we have in discussions all the time, our member states, as you know, don't agree among themselves on uh, always on, on Nord Stream or its, uh, or its uh, necessity. Uh, so the, uh, the European Union does not uh, have a position on that. What we do have a position is on ensuring that we have laws in the EU that touch on Nord Stream as well, uh, that ensure that uh, that foreigners uh, apply EU laws. Uh, and we do have a position uh, that we are entirely capable as Europeans 
of dealing with the challenge of energy security and energy diversification uh, without anyone else uh, telling us uh, how to do it, let alone uh, threatening us on this or any other issue, uh, including our closest uh, allies. So um, I think, and I suppose, what many people don't know is that we do have this gas directive in place, but also what they don't know is that we have diversified massively. And if you want a civil, silver bullet, if you want to ensure that no country, including Russia, can have any chokehold, even theoretical, assuming that it wanted to or that it could, on any European Union country, look at the energy diversification that we do. Uh, LNG imports from the United States alone have increased by 400% the past two years alone. That's because we have invested massively in, uh, in LNG terminals around the EU uh, to ensure that we can actually take the LNG and process it. We've invested massively in grids that can take that energy from one place of Europe to another place of Europe, and we're doing much more as we speak. That is uh, supremely important for diversification uh, for anyone, uh, including the, uh, the, uh, the US, uh, which I believe also imports uh, uh, gas from uh, Russia and uh, from other sources uh, or, uh, or oil. Um, it is supremely important for all of us to ensure that energy becomes greener. Uh, we can become more self-reliant on it. We can support each other with new sources of it, that we can begin decoupling ourselves from fossil fuels and for from major energy uh, polluting um, uh, means that we can cooperate to ensure that this happens in the most economically effective way. And that at the same time, as we transition to that point, uh, we diversify energy supplies. Uh, and that is what we are doing in Europe. And I'm, uh, and I'm very proud of the work we are doing uh, in that field. Let me ask you quickly about, we're running out of time, just a couple more questions. Uh, uh, ask you quickly about China. Um, most European countries, I think, do agree, and you kind of hinted this at the beginning, that, um, forgive me, I just lost my video there, but I'll, I'll ask you, um, most people, European countries agree that um, the China has not been playing, you said at the beginning, not been, has been playing unfairly by the international rules uh, over, over, the, over the years, whether it's with regard to things like um, you know, intellectual property rights, um, technology transfer, all of these things. And yet, yet the United States under President Trump has taken a very tough line on this, very, very tough in terms of the trade relationship with, uh, with tariffs uh, and, and other measures. Where does the European Union stand on that? Obviously, is, is, is the European Union, you know, kind of happy to see the United States um, be out there, be out in front, taking a tough line on this, but in a way that does, but but the you, you, in a way that the European Union can benefit from whatever the United States is able to get from China in these negotiations, because because for the European Union, the economic relationship with China is so important, particularly for a country like Germany, obviously where uh, exports to China are enormous and uh, a very important part of the economy. There's a sense here, I think, perhaps in the United States, that maybe you know the European Union is kind of playing playing both sides here, isn't coming out very clearly in support of the United States in urging China taking measures to force China to, be a, to, to, play, to play fair because it doesn't want to jeopardize its own economic relationship with China. Is that fair? No, but it's a very complex relationship and the US has it as well. So um, if you look at the phase one trade deal that was completed with China, that was in fact a major um, um, a discussion about the US exports uh, to, to the country. So the US itself is not saying that I don't care about the Chinese market or about the relationship. Uh, the question is, how can you be most effective, both in the U.S., but I cannot speak for the U.S., for the EU, to ensure that China plays by the rules and is a fair trade uh, partner? It is not up to now. Uh, only two days ago, uh, the, uh, the president of the European Council, the president of the European Commission, and, uh, and the chancellor of Germany as the presidency of the EU these six months had a, uh, another meeting with uh, President uh, Xi Jinping of China. And, uh, and a big part of the discussion was the investment uh, agreement, investment protection agreement that we have been discussing signing with China for a long time. And a big part of that discussion uh, was expressing the European uh, uh, concerns about parts of that agreement um, that uh, touch on very important issues of market access and firm market access for EU companies that China has not uh, budged on. Uh, we are using our own uh, strength, the strength of our own European economy, 
uh, as leverage uh, when we discuss with the Chinese on these issues. And we are not sitting back idly at all, um, uh, either uh, kowtowing or, uh, or trying to benefit uh, in, in a way that uh, I think all our companies understand uh, is not possible anymore. At the same time, we have, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, we have, implied, uh, we have applied investment screening in the EU for, uh, for uh, we also have applied now uh, a new policy about public procurement in the EU in which we are not going to be any longer allowing companies uh, to come and, and, and bid for public procurement projects in the EU if those companies are actually being supported by the taxpayers' money in another country being fully subsidized or greatly subsidized and undermining fair competition in the EU. And of course, when it comes to 5G and other areas uh, that are truly national security um, uh, related in some uh, instances. Uh, in the national security part of that conversation, uh, we are also very firm. So uh, I don't think that's fair. I think the fairest thing to say, the most obvious thing to say is the following. Um, China is out there and will be out there. Um, if the United States and the European Union um, work together to address the issues that we consider to be unfair uh, in China's practices or the issues that we consider to be dangerous on the basis of values, uh, then the two biggest open economies in the world can absolutely have the upper hand. And if we manage to create more multilateral coalitions, including at the, the WTO um, uh, or elsewhere, we will be, uh, I am sure, very successful. It may not be a magic bullet, but I'm not seeing any magic bullets here either. Um, in, uh, I mean, this is a long term, this is a marathon. Uh, you have to be very tough at the beginning of the marathon. You cannot fall behind. But you have to understand that it is cooperation among like-minded partners that in the end of the day will win you that trophy. Uh, and that is what uh, I'm working on every day to achieve uh, in my role as EU ambassador in this country. Final question, Ambassador. Thank you very much indeed. And you lead me to this question. Um, and it's the old question about what is the European Union? Um, as you know, the whole issue of um, how much integration, further, further integration there should be within the European Union remains a very important one. And with Britain gone now, you could maybe argue that the largest break on, the heaviest break on, on internal um, integration and the ever closer union and the movement towards a, a, a federal system, a federal state, um, that with Britain gone, that could become, uh, that could be accelerated. As you know, that's President Macron in France has, has indicated that he wants to see a much more um, integrated European role on issues like foreign policy and security policy and defence and, and more broadly. And we've already seen these changes to, um, you know, some of the fiscal measures that the European Union has where there's now much more um, a willingness uh, by states to essentially um, cross subsidize if you like other states if you want to put it like that through uh, the, through 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 bond issuance and various these other measures that have been taken are we headed towards a situation where where we are where the united states is going to be for all intents and purposes the united states of europe no i don't think so i think a part of the uh, the great pride and the great strength of the eu is is a unity in diversity um we, uh, we have decided to pull together uh, our sovereignties on a number of areas where we feel that alone each one of the member states in a, in a changing world would be much weaker, uh, including in trade. Uh, and uh, our citizens uh, have been, uh, uh, in uh, vast majorities uh, since Brexit, in fact, uh, indicating an increased support for the European Union and for the role that they believe it plays in their lives. Um, we are not um, in any way trying to create a um, melting pot of uh, member states, but we are very consciously looking at areas in which uh, pulling a sovereignty together can make each, each of our individual sovereignties even more uh, effective. You mentioned uh, the, the recent decisions, remarkable historic decisions about um, supporting each other for economic recovery after COVID, including through the joint issuance of debt something that was a very contentious issue a few years back uh, during the financial crisis. Uh, but now, uh, in a situation where, um, uh, you know, uh, COVID came and hit us all, um, uh, it became very clear uh, and, uh, and much easier for you member states to unite uh, behind. Um, the decisions were made on, on climate uh, and on digital and on transformer economies. In fact, um, creating a new investment fund, because that is really what the new generation EU fund is, uh, that was announced of the 750 billion. 
a new investment fund to, to, to invest in green and in digital together uh, is something that uh, will boost the economies of our member states working more together on defense. Uh, the so-called PESCO and EDF and all these acronyms that Europeans use so everyone think that they're a bunch of bureaucrats. Uh, but in fact, uh, in real life, uh, are combining our resources and our power to become much more effective in a collective uh, security presence around the world, including in our neighborhood, and a much more reliable partner for the United States as well. Uh, all these are, are, are indications of that. Sometimes people look at the EU and they, and, and they don't understand it. I get that. Um, and they try to compare it to the US. And although we're not going to be a United States of Europe, uh, if you look at, 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 at the elements of, of the EU project, you will see so many things that are similar. Um, no, we're not a bureaucracy. I'm always, I'm always impressed by the fact that everyone working for the US government is a civil servant, but everyone working for, for the European um, the Commission is, is a bureaucrat. <laughs> I, I don't get how this works. But fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, there's a European Parliament that has uh, virtually co-equal powers now with the member states in legislation, uh, and it's elected directly by the European citizens. Uh, you have uh, a commission president uh, that is, um, uh, uh, has to be approved by the European Parliament, who then appoints um, one commissioner from each uh, of our member states, uh, as proposed from our member states, which is no different than an elected president in the US um, uh, appointing unelected uh, secretaries of this or secretary of that. And indeed, we have uh, different uh, US uh, uh, member states, different countries. Um, but, you know, um, is it a lack, is it a loss of sovereignty to be an Italian and a European, uh, to be a, a German and a European, uh, to have been a Brit and a European? Uh, none of us feel that way. In the exact same way, I'm guessing, because I've been around this great country now here in the United States. I've been around this great country. Okay, you're right. Uh, I've been around this great country, uh, you know, uh, a lot in the past year and a half that I'm here. And, you know, you go to some U.S. states and sometimes you feel that you're not, I mean, the pride that a Texan feels, right? I'm a Texan, right? Uh, at the same time, they're equally proud Americans. Uh, being very proud of being a Greek or, uh, or a Maltese or, or, or a Pole uh, in no way stops you or should be presumed to be bizarre to stop you from being equally proud of being a European. And the great accomplishment of the European Union, perhaps, may be this, that after decades of integration, slow one, careful one, um, we have reached a point uh, that we are confident in our national identities and equally confident of a European one, that we are increasingly working closer together on things, but also, just as in the federal system of the states, having many competences belonging to our member states and not to Brussels, not to Europe. Uh, so, you know, Maybe there are many more issues in common here than, uh, than uh, indifference, if you were to look at the two systems. And maybe look at it that way may make the EU less of a strange, bizarre animal in the eyes and ears of many Americans and more of a, uh, a clearly uh, hugely democratic, hugely peaceful, hugely prosperous uh, partner of the US, which is what we always were and always want to be. Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. You've been extremely thank generous you. with your time and extremely generous with your very, uh, uh, very insightful thoughts and, and observations. Thank you very much indeed. For and may I say, Jerry, I think, I, I think you treated me with kids' gloves. <laughs> I have watched some of your shows, read some of your columns. I'm pretty sure you could have devoured me uh, uh, you're being... much, 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 much more easily had you, did, had you wanted to. So let, thank you. Thank you for thank you for being so kind as well. Oh, it was a it, it was a pleasure, and, and you're being way too modest. You very deftly handled every single uh, thing I could throw at you. So thank you very much indeed for doing that. I'm going to hand it back to Gemma. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Lambrinidis, Mr. Baker. Uh, thank you for this very insightful conversation. We could have certainly continued for hours. Um, it's been really a pleasure to hear you both. Uh, cover all these topics that we are all very interested in. So thank you again. And uh, hopefully we can have you again in a year uh, to see where we are at many of these topics. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you.